Hey there, everybody. Just because current conditions are such that we can't meet inside our amazing Zeiss Planetarium at the Chabot Space and Science Center, doesn't mean we can't go outside and look up at the real sky ourselves. This short presentation will help guide you to find several bright stars, constellations, and planets. For the month of September, the summer solstice skies will be shifting into the fall equinox system of constellations, which can be seen around 9 p.m., and it's these I'll be pointing out. Since we are leaving that time of the year when our northern hemisphere's night skies are their shortest, we can begin to view earlier in the evening, and temperatures will still be mild. How fine! By the way, if this is your first time here, yes, the constellations have seasons. For example, you'll never see Gemini the Twins during the summer, and likewise you'll never see Cygnus the Swan in the winter. We'll meet Cygnus in just a bit. As you probably already know, the Earth has four seasons. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. Well, the constellations also have seasons, having to do with the Earth's orbital path around the Sun. That, and the fact that we can only see stars by looking away from the Sun at night, which changes our view of the stars throughout the year. Unfortunately, unless you're at a good dark sky site, most constellations will be somewhat hard to see fully. But most constellations have at least a few bright stars to help identify them, and the better your viewing location, the more you'll be able to see. A good first step to finding the constellations is done by knowing your compass directions. We can easily do this without a compass using a star grouping that is easy to find, Cassiopeia the Queen, also known as the Big W. Face the sky roughly 90 degrees to the right of where the sun has just set, and look about one-third up from the horizon to the top of the sky, and you'll see it. In this version of Cassiopeia, the five stars that make up the W shape is actually her throne, which, from this angle, is upside down. The sixth star makes up the seat of the throne, which can be seen to have a rather unergonomic back. Off the tip of the more squashed end of the W, you might see another somewhat faint seventh star. Just connect the end of the W to that star and extend the line until it comes to the semi-bright star, which is named Polaris and is otherwise known as the North Star. It's the only star in the entire sky that stays pretty much right where it is. So no matter what time of night it is, or even what month of the year it is, all you need to do is face that star, and you'll always be facing due north, with east directly to your right, west directly to your left, and south directly behind you. All the other stars wheel around this pivot point anti-clockwise, making them appear to rise in the east and set in the west. This is, of course, an illusion caused by the Earth's spin, which gives the appearance that the stars are moving, when in fact, it's the Earth that's moving. If you think of the Earth as a spinning top, and you extend Earth's north pole straight up into the sky, it points almost directly at Polaris. Using Polaris, we found all the compass directions, but Polaris is also the end of the Little Dipper's Handle. Official name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, and our next constellation. It's a bit faint, but from Polaris, you might be able to trace its curving handle to its bowl. The two brighter stars at the end of the bowl are called the Guardians, because they seem to march around the North Star like protective sentries throughout the night. Here is Draco the Dragon, with his squarish head, long neck, two short legs and feet, and a long tail which arcs gracefully over the Little Dipper. Just between Draco and Cassiopeia we find our next constellation, Cepheus the King, and yes, he is Cassiopeia's husband. At this time of night he's upside down, but he's got a triangular crown, a squarish head with a pigtail at the base of his head, and he's smiling, because he's the king. I like finding him by using the non-squashed end of Cassiopeia, which points directly into his face. 
Just to the right and a bit down from Cassiopeia is the king and queen's daughter Andromeda, the chained lady. She's got one star as her head, a torso, and one arm pointing out away from her body with a couple of chains attached. The other foreshortened arm is curled down below, and she has one straight leg, while the other leg is up and bent at the knee. Andromeda is easy to find because the star representing her head is one of the four stars that make up the asterism known as the Great Square. An asterism, by the way, is not an official constellation, but only a familiar star grouping, like the Big Dipper which is only part of the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear. We'll run into a couple more asterisms before the end of the evening, so keep an eye out for them. To continue, let's turn our view to the south, like so. This will flip everything we've seen to the north upside down, and will enable us to find the rest of the night's major constellations more easily. The other three stars of the Great Square make up the wing of our next constellation, Pegasus, the winged horse. His wing attaches to the rear end of his body, and he's got four legs, neck, and a long, horsey nose. To the right of Pegasus is Cygnus the Swan, who I first mentioned near the beginning of this presentation. It's got large, sweeping wings, a long neck, and a nose. Its brightest star is called Deneb. To the right of Cygnus we find Lyra the lyre, a small Greek harp, and not a person who tells untruths. Its brightest star is the seventh brightest star in the night sky, Vega. Just below Cygnus and Lyra we have the constellation Achilla, the eagle. He is a bit faint, but has a head with a beak and its bright eye Altair, two forward-swept wings, a body, and a tail. The three bright stars Vega, Altair, and Deneb make up our next asterism, which we call the Summer Triangle. You'll recall I mentioned asterisms before, with the Big Dipper and the Great Square. Though it's called the Summer Triangle, we'll be seeing this familiar star grouping through the remainder of summer and well into the fall, before losing it to the daylight of the sun. To the right of Lyra, we find our next constellation, Hercules the Strong Man. That square is the asterism called the Keystone, and from there you might be able to make out the rest of him, a man running along whilst brandishing a large club. Somewhat low above the southern horizon is a kind of invisible line where the zodiacal constellations can be found. This line is called the ecliptic, and it's also where the sun, moon, and planets move along. This is why the zodiacal constellations were so significant to astrologers. Not that astronomy scientists believe in the pseudoscience of astrology. Most don't. But astrologers were some of history's first astronomers, and for their early work we are in their debt. Our first zodiacal constellation is the constellation of Scorpius the Scorpion, or as astrologers call him, Scorpio. He's got two arms and claws, his bright reddish heart is Antares, and a long body with a stinger in his tail. Because the Scorpion is a sign of the zodiac, and because the planets only move along the ecliptic where the zodiacal signs are found, sometimes the also reddish in color planet Mars passes near Antares. Mars represents the Greek god of war, Ares, so as to avoid confusing the two reddish stars, one is called Ares, and the other is called not Ares, or Antares. To the left of Scorpius is the constellation Sagittarius, the archer, with his triangular head, body, feet, and left hand holding out his bow, while his right hand is held aloft, as though he just loosed an arrow. A lot of Sagittarius is too faint to be fully seen, but he's got yet another asterism that the brighter parts of him are easy to find, called the teapot. So, unless you're at a good dark sky sight, look for the teapot, and you'll have found a good portion of Sagittarius. Just to the left of Sagittarius are two bright, quote-unquote, stars, which aren't stars at all, but rather the planets Saturn on the left and Jupiter on the right. 
If you get a chance, take a look at them through as big a telescope as you can. They are both rather spectacular. Just to the left of Saturn and Jupiter, is our next zodiacal constellation, Capricornus the goat. At first glance, he looks like a child's top or an upside-down pyramid. But as you can see, he's got a horn on his head, a body with legs, and a small tail. Our last zodiacal constellation is Aquarius the water bearer. Though unless you're at a really good dark sky sight, I'd skip trying to find him as he is quite faint. As you can see, he looks like a man holding a vessel of water that's spilling as he runs along. Our last three constellations of the night make up one large constellation, Ophiuchus, the medicine man. He's also quite faint, but as you can see, he's got a triangular head, large upright rectangular body. He's holding two halves of a snake, which are called serpens cauda, the snake's tail, and serpens caput, the snake's head, and his feet are just above Scorpius. And that's it. There are other, smaller, or fainter constellations out there, which I encourage you to look for using a good book, and maybe a pair of binoculars, too. Speaking of good books, I cannot more highly recommend the book The Stars, A New Way to See Them, by the author H. A. Ray, who you may know as the same author who wrote the Curious George books. Ray was a scientist who wasn't satisfied with the way modern star charts were drawn. The astro-scientists were not interested in the characters, objects, or stories behind the constellations, so for their convenience they just connected the brighter stars into weird geometric shapes, slapped on their Greek names, many of which would mean nothing to the common person, and left it at that. That's all fine and well for them, but for us regular folk? we're more interested in the fun stuff. If you really want to learn the constellations, get Ray's book, which can be purchased from Amazon.com for about $12. I'd also recommend getting a pair of binoculars before getting a telescope. Binoculars are cheaper and easier to use, and there are many wonderful deep sky objects that can actually be best seen with just a pair of binoculars. Those objects are noted in Ray's book. If you do want to get a telescope, ask us, or research on the web, how to make an informed purchase. Be warned, there are a lot of bad telescopes out there, with cheap components and shaky, muddy, fuzzy views that will disappoint you every time. A good scope will inspire you and your children to a lifetime of deep space exploration and an appreciation of science and nature in general. If you're interested in getting into the hobby of astronomy, joining a local astronomy club can be most helpful. Chabot is partnered with the EAS, the East Bay Astronomical Society, which has many activities and resources you'll find essential to help you get started in this amazing and beautiful study of our natural universe. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked this content, be sure to click the thumbs up button subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell notification icon to find out when new content has been uploaded. This will really help our channel to grow, which would make us very happy. And we'll see you in the future.